Welcome to the Practical Enneagram. Marion Gilbert is an established and experienced physical therapist that came to the Enneagram in the early noughties, initially working with Helen Palmer and her colleagues at the Narrative Enneagram. Marion, I believe, brought in a lot of the distinctions that the Narrative Enneagram uses around the somatic structures of Enneagram types. She now offers her own Somatic Enneagram program certification. That's where I met her on module one of that. Marion's also an adjunct adjunct faculty member of the Narrative Enneagram tradition and also an advisor to the Enneagram Prison Project. This interview goes into the somatic lens of perception. This is an important dimension to work with if you're using the Enneagram for your development or your client development, because this this aspect of awakening can't really be ignored. We can't really achieve transformation just on the cognitive emotional planes. Achieve isn't quite the right word, but I really enjoyed meeting with Marion and learning from her. She's an inspiring teacher. And her work of mapping the contracted and expanded body states was really new to me, a really important dimension to add. Marion doesn't talk about contracted body states as being the subtype behaviours. The way she maps it by linking the fight, flight, freeze responses to Enneagram types explains what is driving the subtype behaviour. I hope that you enjoy So Marion, thank you for taking the time to do this with me. I'm happy to be here. Great. I'm going to ask you how you are again, just so for the benefit of people listening. I'm actually quite well this morning. We have a wonderful spring here and we just had a well-needed rain in California. I know in England that is not an issue, but for us it is. And so everything is green and blooming and smelling like roses. So I'm happy currently mm-hmm. as well as that I'm vaccinated. And here in in this area, people have been able, you know, to meet each other with, of course, masks on and all of that. But we all the restaurants had outdoor dining. And so and plus, I work with people all day long for the whole year. So I've had enough people contact, you know, the whole time during COVID. And that's because obviously, you're a physical therapist, as well as teacher of yeah. somatic enneagram yeah yeah I'm a therapist for 40 years and i started to be in contact with the enneagram in 2003 what were your first impressions of it as a system did you take to it right away well it was more the introduction to it that convinced me that there was something very um, special about it and i've done a lot of you know continuing education courses meditation courses and yoga and martial arts and so on but when i saw that one of my employees came back from an Enneagram training. And I just noticed that there was something significantly changed in her, in her behavior, in the way that she took up space. And she happened to be a five. And I didn't know yet that I was an eight more. And I remember always having this difficulty to let her know that as soon as I would come and right next to her physically, she would jump out of her seat, you know, and I didn't understand. And as and I already said to her, you need to learn how to stay seated, because all I'm doing is looking at schedule so that I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then When she came back from this training, you know, she was taking up her seat. Her presence was different. She was speaking up and but not contrived. I mean, really from a place of something that, you know, became more alive in her. That was my interest. And I said, whatever that is, I need to know about that. That's a really powerful introduction to the Enneagram, so tangible as well. That transformation had happened on the basis of just a workshop. That's incredible. Well, it was a training. So she was there for, I think, four five days. And, mm-hmm. you know, she worked for us. So I saw her before and then I saw her when she came back. Anyone who's sort of been in the Enneagram world will know that you brought the somatic dimension to um, Helen Palmer's narrative Enneagram school. I'd love a a glimpse of how that early conversation went. How how did that happen? Well, really, before I went to the the training, I actually had the pleasure of having Peter O'Hanrahan come and teach our 
staff at the time about wow. the Enneagram. And he did also a somatic workshop. And I realized there was something here that I probably have and carry, but I don't know exactly. I, I had no idea what that was. You know, then I came into the training and Terry Saracino was there and she had just gone through some kind of trauma uh, work in, inside of herself. And she was very excited about the somatic components. She didn't call it that at the time. She called it the trauma work. As we began to speak, and I had taken some of the trauma resolution training from Peter Levine, I began to see the moment that this frosty, we call it frosty, the three center circles vertically placed on the screen. And the top, the mental was very, a lot of words were put in there, fixation, holy ideas, core emotion. Mm -hmm. And then on the emotional circle, there were the vice and the virtue and all of that. There And on the bottom, it was pretty much empty. And all it said was subtypes and instincts, but no other words. The subtypes are not, even though they are behaving behaviors and they're based on some form of need to discharge a certain amount of energy physically in order to not have to feel you know your overwhelm in the system it doesn't describe what's fueling it it doesn't describe that same bottom what is on the left side in the contracted aspect of the body center and what is on the expansive side right and that is really what's driving the subtype behavior so the behavior is more a psychological model to notice how the behavior is for three different subtype orientations but it's not talking about what's fueling it that that instincts and subtypes was empty there I said oh my gosh you know how it is you have a direct hit in your being and it says oh my god I know something about this you know slowly I began to co-teach with Helen in first by assisting her in the deepening of spiritual awareness and then I was being invited into co-teaching with Helen and Terry and Terry and I began to teach workshops together that I had designed in order to teach people how to access this part of their Enneagram structure using the defense structure and the trauma resolution theory, but all in the function of how to become a three-centered being. Mm. So what is the somatic Enneagram? So put simply, what does that mean? So the somatic is a is an, you know, Greek word for mm. soma connected to being and body. So it has something to do with the space that we take up in the world as a separate human being that is physically and instinctually wired for survival. Mm -hmm. And that will always take priority over the emotional and the cognitive part of our being. Basically, where the somatic piece comes in, in relationship to the beginning patterns of how we split reality in nine different ways. How it connects with the Enneagram, of course, right? Yeah. Say a little more about that, Mario. What is the somatic nature of, say, I don't know, of Enneagram 4, of Enneagram 8? Yeah. So we know that Enneagram 4 is having a filtering system of reality that primarily goes through the heart center. People that register emotional content first, right. but that doesn't mean that they don't have a survival belly center. No matter what type we are and what center we lead with, we have all three centers and we mm. need all centers in order to have of a more complete picture of how we filter reality through these centers. Each center has a particular lens of perception, yeah. completely different, these lenses, and we need all three of them. Right. So the body center, the eight, for instance, will always filter a reality based on the sensate reality first. Mm -hmm. Got it. So the somatic Enneagram is sort of the biases inherent in our type structures and the way we filter reality. First and foremost, you need to understand that the somatic lens of perception operates subcortically, which means it's largely in the space of not being conscious. 
Mm. So all that we don't notice most of the time, mm. but we place our attention on the felt sense lens of perception, we can consciously begin to get information from that somatic state that we are in that is connected with a certain aspect of our Enneagram defensive state. So the defense system in the Enneagram described in nine different ways is actually what I use to be able to work with, you know, the part of our defenses mechanism that keeps us away from a certain part of reality. When we are little, we may have experienced an overwhelming amount of charge through the body that we could not conduct in our nervous system. So the body began to contain it and wall it off. Mm -hmm. And so we could return back to functioning. But these parts that have been contained, they sit within us. And in the Enneagram world, type structure, not the personality, but the type structure that drives the personality is what we're addressing in being able to teach you how you can use somatic intelligence to relax your type structure. Because a whole bunch of reactive behavior, we do not have to go to and play out any longer when we are capable of doing that. So as what's occurring to me as you're talking is, as coaches, we already need to do a lot of work on ourselves in order even to be able to use this because somatic awareness, intelligence, <laughs> what is the general capacity of that? It's fairly low, yeah. isn't it? It's fairly low in the human race. As we are, you know, developing, and even if you look at the school systems, the body as a center of intelligence is not even being recognized. Mm, yeah. Everything has to do with intelligence is by over-celebrating the neocortex. You know, what in the anatomy and physiology is whatever you don't use, you lose content. Yeah. You don't develop capacity there. So that's mm -hmm. what I teach is to bring that somatic part of your awareness back into onto your screen of awareness. And based on that, we can work with the breath and the felt sense lens of perception to go to the places inside of you that are chronically, you know, obstructed or tight or, and you might not even know they exist. But you will get to know by breathing in and feeling where the breath can flow freely and where the breath is being stopped. Get a mapping of your inner territory based on that. And so what are the like basic pillars to even get this on the screen, the basic foundations in somatic awareness? I know that you teach this in mod module one of your program, but if we could just so, say a little. Yeah, I can say something briefly about how my s somatic awareness development is set up. Mm. And it's very important that you understand that just because you're an athlete or a dancer or a good yoga instructor or whatever, doesn't mean you have a lot of somatic awareness. Well, that's good to know, actually, because that was an assumption I had made as a yoga student. I get people all the time and you know I'm asking them questions via a somatic lens of perception and they may be aware where certain tightnesses and restrictions are but as far as just using the breath uh, in a general sort of way you know they don't have any other way to really understand what these tightnesses are about and what they really you know what they are for and how they got there. So foundational elements of the somatic awareness practice are to first cultivate uh, your ability to orient yourself in time and space to develop grounded presence. It's not just grounding, grounded presence. Mm -hmm. it, what's the difference between those two? So grounding from what I get from most people is like feeling your feet on the ground mm -hmm. and notice that you're standing on the earth and blah, blah, blah. But that's only a small part of grounded presence. Okay. The word of presence means that you are a uh, available with your awareness in the here and now. Mm -hmm. So you're here in the space that you're in and you're also available in the present moment that your mind is not somewhere in the future or somewhere in the past. But the present moment is the only moment you have. Our cognitive brain travels more in the past and in, in, the, in the future than that it actually is abiding in the present moment. So that's 
a cultivation that is very important. So you need to learn how to orient yourself to the earth below you, the sky above you, the four directions around you. There's a horizontal and a vertical reality. And that is what your conduit is aligning itself with, not just with the ground below you. Right. Okay. So it's, like, it's more four dimensional than just having your feet on the ground. Okay. And so the tracking of the breath is a good way to learn how to, you know, have that four dimensional. I was saying when you stand still, it's three dimensional. But then when you learn how to sustain attention of present moment awareness, you are, you know, adding the fourth dimension into it. Mm-hmm. And then we have the inner observer cultivation which is really important that's a faculty of mind that is objective Mm. and not hardwired in the type structure it's not conditioned it is simply here to observe what is without having to know anything about it or do anything about it or expect something from it having to come into action right it's observing Mm -hmm. so and then we have also the cultivation of the placement of attention Mm -hmm. and i call it the art of placement of attention of course in most meditations what is being taught but now neuroscience has actually uh, verified that energy follows attention so wherever you place your attention energy follows and that that part of what you're paying attention to comes onto your screen of awareness so you can already see from the Enneagram point of view that each type has a habit of attention mm-hmm. that's based on where it feels it needs to place the attention in order to belong and stay connected and be loved and be validated, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where most of our attention goes if we don't consciously place it. Right. That reinforces the pattern. Right. Every time we sort of tread that neural pathway of our type. That's right. And it becomes more and more myelinated. And (laughs) therefore, you know, we are constantly in a state of self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And it keeps us not understanding how anybody else cannot see what we see or experience what we experience. Mm. Okay. So those are the three sort of foundational pillars of somatic awareness. And actually you could just spend your life practicing those, couldn't you? They're so big. Yeah. It's so big, but so essential that without this, whatever I'm teaching about the somatic lens of perception will not be able to be accessed. So you can see an evolutionary process. Yeah. Totally. It's only when you're able to do that, that the body of knowledge that the Enneagram gives us becomes actually useful, isn't it? And it will give you access to transformation rather than trying to cognitively change your type structure. A lot of the Enneagram is being taught. Yeah. Method that we bring to this particular way of learning how to relax type structure is first and foremost to place the attention of the inner observer in the present moment onto the breath and the, and the felt sense lens of perception, the sensate awareness of my being. And the easiest way to do that is by following the breath, as this is a natural movement that occurs that gives us a feeling of the expansion and the relaxation of our body that creates a certain sensation in our body. Mm -hmm. And you can always access that. Got it. And with that, you can feel where the breath is already free. Yeah. And moves through us with ease. And then you have places where the breath is feeling like it can't penetrate or it's blocked or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? Now Mm -hmm. we have an internal mapping situation that is coming onto our screen of awareness because we have placed our attention there. You know, the method is actually developing with creating the resources simultaneously next to where the contraction is being experienced so that the third force, the reconciling force, according to Gurdjieff, can enact on the first two that have become split. And that is where the transformation can be witnessed. You can do the relaxation from a mental point of view. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Is that you integrating Peter Levine's work? The the stuff that you teach around... Um, touching the places of resource that's that's you bringing that in as well yeah 
I was happy to be taught by Peter Levine, and it was a big moment in my life, and I want to really honor him for bringing this much more holistic way of working with energy and energy body. Early on, before he actually developed his school, as a matter of fact, I still have his pre-book handout of his very first book. He was teaching it in the living rooms of Berkeley at the time, and had a four-day workshop with him or something and it was the missing piece for me between my meditative spiritual being and my psychological somatic being and the Enneagram of course fits in there perfectly it already gives us a map of how we have split into a dualistic way of operating and we have a way to drop all the way down to where the split began mm -hmm. because we the defensive structure and now we can learn how to do somatic inquiry work which is very maybe somewhat different from how trauma work happens because the objective here is not to to uh, treat trauma that's why i'm calling it overwhelm right yeah. because people have adapted around it good enough and they're healthy enough they're not necessarily walking around traumatized so i want to really highlight the difference here yeah okay yeah, yeah. and you do you do that on your uh, course as well. Should we talk a little more about these contracted states of the body center? Because this was brand new to me as well. I only knew distorted instincts as contracted body center states. So can we say a little bit about what forms a contracted body center takes? And do the types follow certain patterns with their contracted body center states? Mm -hmm. They do. So if you look at fight, flight, and the freeze and collapse are two linked ways in which the immobilization response happens. Ironically, they come in threes. So if the driving emotions of each center, if you look at them, like for the head, fear yeah. is the driving emotion. So naturally, you would look at that being connected more with a flight response, mm -hmm. even though at some point with the six, you can have a fight and flight response mm -hmm. that alters based on phobic, counterphobic activities, right? Mm -hmm. But still, the idea is even when they go towards something and attack, the idea is to get past it, not to attack the person. So it's it's still driven by the fear mm -hmm. and the flight response. Three different ways the flight response is being utilized as a first response when they feel threatened. Doesn't mean that they won't use the, the other two because we have access to those. No, but just like we have access to three centers and yet we have a first responder or first filtering center that is active. So is the fear more connected to the flight response and the belly center is more connected with anger and the fight response. Right. Then of course the, the heart makes complete sense that it would freeze in the process because fleeing would mm. means disconnecting, which is mm. something that you don't want to happen. Mm. And fighting means that you're pushing the person away and that causes the disconnect. Mm. So the only one that's left is the freeze response. Yeah. Freeze collapse response. Mm. Right. This really opened up something for me, this description of collapse. I feel like it's going to give me a lot of freedom to be able to just watch that and know that that's that's happening. So that's that's the freeze response. Then we have the body types doing fight yep. in their three the, different ways. The driving emotion is anger, right? So they fight for their protection and setting the boundaries for their right to belong to the planet and also other people's equal right to belong. Mm. That's what we're being, you know, mobilized to defend, so mm. to speak. That's on the contracted side. Yeah. That is how we keep ourselves safe from harm. Right. On the relaxation side, if you look at the flight response and it's driven by fear, when that begins to relax because we manage to flee to a safe space, from there we begin to relax and then it's like the flight response begins to relax into curiosity. Curiosity is a uh, exploration, you know, reflex that is also part of the reflexes. Mm -hmm. So the flight relaxes, it, it automatically automatically turns into curiosity and then when danger comes it goes back into flight 
So they're they're distinctly related to one and another. Mm. So for fight response, when the fight response relaxes, it becomes a, a play and a lust a lust of life kind of re- reaction of relaxation to where the playfulness returns us back into being able to get something, some information about ourselves in space with all the other forms and people and spaces around us. Again, an exploration and discovery, right? Of mm. able to go out into the world and playfully connect with it. And then for the freeze collapse response, when that relaxes, it actually reinstates the seeking yeah. The seeking connection, seeking the warmth, seeking the bonding, seeking whatever it is. And it's connected with the reach reflex, mm. with the arms for mother. Mm. So when decision has occurred, that reach reflex is kind of interrupted. They feel like they can't reach out. Mm. Therefore, they re-experience that abandonment or that separation and that disconnect and the grief at the loss of contact. Yeah, the Contact is what's driving the freeze response when it's not being responded to. This language just really Really touches me every single time I don't know why it brings a lot of compassion to remember that this is survival level stuff you know I mean look at our human nature and our human condition and how how much we are all really succumbing to this inevitable wounding the core wound of the split and the separation the disconnect and and feeling a lack of validation by not being protected enough mm. right and then something else that I got from you was that we're not trying to get rid of these contracted states the reconciling happens in the awareness of both right so that is more a non-dual teaching understands and recognizes that our little cognitive western mind wants to say if we can get rid of that because it doesn't feel good then we automatically will reside in that and that exactly reinforces the split it's not to get from the vice to the virtue not to get from the fixation to the holy idea Mm. it's not to go from fight fight and fleece to the play, curiosity, and all of that. It is understanding that these two exist in only in relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. And that essence is something that comes into being when these two opposing parts actually begin to be equally paid attention to simply because they're both there for our evolution while we're here on this planet and our learning Once they're equally being allowed in the field energetically, not just conceptually, the third force, the reconciling force, enacts on those two aspects with our conscious awareness of the experience of that. It's Mm. not that we are making it happen. The third force is already here. Right. The oneness of all things is already here. Everything is already inseparably connected. And you know what I'm saying? But we can't experience it. We can't recognize it because we're caught in that split. Mm. I had a question in my mind about whether this approach working with the somatic dimension is more powerful for some Enneagram types than others. But I don't think it is, is it, Marion? It's important for everyone. No. Ultimately not. You know, for some people, it will be easier in the beginning. Like Mm. type five, they have Mm. an ability to place their attention and focus and stay present. So it's easier in the beginning for them to do it. But on the back end of the process, it's the hardest for them to really release their thinking. Mm. Yeah. what What they already know and to include the unknown. And for the seven, for instance, it's much harder to have sustained focus of attention, placement mm-hmm. of attention, the beginning. But back end, their mind is so willing to include all activities. For them, it's more to learn how to be okay with not things that are not okay. Yeah. Can we, in theory, work at this level without even engaging with the psychological Enneagram? Becoming aware of the psychological processes and having them named so that you can recognize them when they arrive at your doorstep. 
where where it becomes uh, a little bit sad psychological type structure is being used as an excuse mm. so, and also with the expectation that therefore you need to just put up with it and that's not that is a lower use of the enneagram i say to people yes by all means it helps you maybe find your type but ultimately, you need to go from structure through the emotional structure all the way down to the energetic structure to be able to relax type structure itself. And therefore, all that psychological content will still occur. And it's not what the problem is. It's the identification with it. That, that is who I am. Yeah. So it's not that we don't look at the psychological enneagram. It's that we don't look at it without also developing an, an ability to be at home in our bodies and 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 witness the structures coming alive. Is there anything culturally you've noticed that you need to be aware of when working at the level of the body, Marion, with the different cultures that you've worked with? Well, the most important part is that you are working on a level where you can potentially, if you don't understand it re-traumatize either other people if you mm. work with or yourself mm. so how do we avoid doing that you avoid doing that by really taking a proper course a lot of people that have taken the workshops with me now without really completing a, a training and a certificate and you know they putting it on their platform and i um, have as of yet not given any permission for other people. And I say that in my training, unless you have a professional therapeutic or a coaching degree and you understand how to work with this with a certain amount of consciousness, you know, you have no business to really do it A on other people. And you need to make sure that you are being guided through the particular rough spots, even though I can teach you how not to harm yourself. Yeah. So we do need to be sort of trauma conscious and trauma aware. The personal question now, if I can, is how has doing eight been an asset to you in, um, pioneering this aspect of the Enneagram and how, if if at all, has it not? Oh, yeah, both. <laughs> it was a huge detriment and it also helped me to come onto the path because as an eight, you know, my somatic structure was not very forgiving, right? Mm -hmm. I The energy that was mobilized energetically and physically, even since I was a kid, was it, it could not be controlled and it could not be even though I learned how to do it sufficiently so that I could end up coming into the world and using physical therapy as a way for me to be in the practice of using touch and movement in being with people. And that allowed me to get a lot of information via my hands, via my felt sense, via listening to people carefully when they were describing what was going on and having my hands on their bodies and saying, mm, that doesn't really feel like that is true. They would say, oh, you know, but that's not really a problem anymore. And their body went like, eh, you know, <laughs> into subtraction. It's like, oh, I feel what is going on here, I would say to them. So having these lovely human beings for 40 years on my table, they were my teachers. Mm. And I was too much in when I was too little and when I was defended to where, I mean, I learned so much from that. Well, it's an early opening spiritual experience in my young 20s that just blew my socks off to the, to the point to where I realized in that opening, in that spiritual opening, even there as an eight, it was overwhelming to integrate because, you know, I'm an eight and I juice everything up. I can't help it. It's the way my energy body works. So for better and for worse, I just decided, oh, if I breathe one more breath into this experience, this sensate experience of expansion, I'm going to be annihilated and dispersed into many tiny little particles. That's what it felt like. Mm. Now, with 
what that would have happened or not, I will never know because that's when the contraction came in and it helped me come back to more of my regular self, but that experience I never forgot. When I was in my 50s, after I met the Enneagram, I had an opposite experience of, you know, once I knew that I had to do something with that avoidance, and in my case, it's vulnerability or weakness. As a good eight, I was said, okay, I'm going to do vulnerability and I'm going to do weak, which of course was, you know, throwing me up against the wall and bounced off that wall many, many times. And, you know, I was able to ride the wave with everything I knew, my spiritual life, my energetic teachings that I have received, my trauma resolution. I had all that under my belt, but I didn't have that. I would have been short circuiting at that mm-hmm. point. Yeah. So, you know, for better or for worse, we are married with our type structure mm-hmm. to recognize that it is there also to teach our soul structure something really important about our our soul and our our spirit that is here to learn something about who we truly are. That's lovely. You can yeah. do everything for your own evolution. Thanks, Marion. Thanks so much for your time. I'm pleased to be offered the opportunity, and it's been lovely to be with you. I hope that you enjoyed that. My next interviewee is Dr. El Shabini, who teaches wonderful things at Enneagram Egypt. Don't forget, please, to leave a rating and subscribe.